Legends of Greek Mythology, the story of Jason and the Golden Fleece, Part 3, The Winning of the Golden Fleece. The next day, after a consultation with the heroes, Jason went straight to King Aetes and told him on what errand he had come. Oh-ho! So you wish to take the Golden Fleece home with you, said Aetes. Well, take it. You are quite welcome. But first, I am sure you will not object to doing one or two little things to oblige me. Just yoke my bulls there to the plough, and plough a few acres in the field of Mars. Then sow some dragon's teeth that I will give you. These dragon's teeth, by the way, are a few of the teeth of the dragon that was killed by Cadmus. They were a present to me from Mars. The words of King Aetes were very polite, but in his tone there was a hidden sneer. Some of the Argonauts remembered having heard that it was this king's practice to sacrifice to the gods all strangers who landed on his shores, just as he would sacrifice cattle or sheep. Medea, the king's daughter, stood by his side when Jason presented himself, and her dark eyes lighted up at the sight of the hero's beauty. Medea was the niece of Circe, the famous enchantress, and she had learned from her aunt the use of many medicinal and poisonous herbs. She knew certain charms and enchantments, too, and had secret rooms in her father's palace where a kettle full of a mysterious mixture was always boiling, and where a little owl sat and looked out of dark corners with its big yellow eyes. No one knew what King Aedes meant to do with the Argonauts, who were now in his power, but at any rate, he entertained them hospitably for several days. During this time, Medea contrived to find Jason alone and gave him a powerful ointment made in her kettle. She also gave him a little violet flower, which had been brought from the banks of the river Leith. The very day after Jason had received these gifts from Medea, King Aetes proposed to entertain his guests by games held in the field of Mars. After a few races had been run, the king said that Jason should now plow an acre with the bulls and then sow the dragon's teeth, and that if he succeeded in this, he might take the golden fleece from the tree where it hung and carry it home to Iolcus. Then Aetes brought out his bulls without any assistance from his slaves, for they were fiery and untamed, and no other hand would dare to touch them. They were magnificent animals, and were certainly strong enough to put an end to any man's life should they desire to do so. Their white horns were tipped with sharp steel points, and their hoofs of solid brass made a great clattering on the stone-paved road as they were led from their stable. Although gentle enough with King Aetes, they had a spark in their eyes that meant danger. After he had hitched the bulls to the plow, the king plowed a furrow, which was so long and straight and deep that the field seemed cut in two. When it was finished, he took the yoke from the bull's necks and let them go free. Now it was Jason's turn. The two bulls had begun grazing in the farther end of the field. As Jason approached them, they lifted their heads and snorted, sending a shower of gleaming sparks flying from their nostrils. Then they began to bellow furiously and to paw up the earth with their brass hoofs, the grass all around there took fire. The people of Colchis were astonished to see that Jason dared to go near such creatures, but they did not know how he was protected. The truth is, he was covered from head to foot with the oil or ointment made from a magic herb which Medea had given him, and although the flying sparks might hit him, they could not set him on fire. So he walked coolly up to the enraged animals and put the yoke on their necks. The rage of the bulls cooled when they saw that Jason was not afraid, and they allowed him to hitch them to the plow. So he plowed his acre according to the agreement, and made his furrows as straight and deep as that of Aetes. If, when driven by the hand of a stranger, the bulls did breathe out a few sparks now and then, that was no more than was to be expected, even though the whole acre was left smoking. King Aetes looked on at the plowing in speechless wonder. This was something he had never seen before. He had supposed that if Jason were foolish enough to dare attempt such a task as this, the poor young man would be killed instantly. 
but the dragon's teeth had not yet been sown. Now we'll see what happens, this wicked king said to himself as he brought them out. Jason took the teeth without a moment's hesitation and sewed them in the furrows, then covered them deep. He had heard the story of Cadmus and the dragon's teeth and only half believed it, but the teeth sprouted and grew now, just as they had in the time of Cadmus. First a few steel spearheads pricked up through the ground. Then the soil all over the plowed acre began to heave, and before Jason knew what had happened, there stood rows of warriors, all armed and looking very fierce. Seeing Jason, the warriors all raised their spears with a great cry and would have attacked him had not Jason hurled a great stone in among them. Then each warrior thought he had been attacked by his brothers, so they all began to fight among themselves and continued fighting till everyone was slain. When the last armed warrior of the dragon's brood had fallen, the Argonauts set up a loud cheer for their leader and brought wreaths and crowned him as they were accustomed to do when a hero won in the games. King Aetes could not now deny to Jason the right to take the golden fleece, but he secretly hoped that Jason would not be able to conquer the dragon that guarded it. Yesterday, he would not have believed it possible that anyone could conquer that dragon, but now it was with some misgiving that he showed the way to the Grove of Mars, where the golden fleece hung. The Grove of Mars stood in a valley or garden called the Garden of Mars, which could be entered only through a narrow ravine between two high rocks. A rapid stream ran between the rocks, and sometimes the dragon of the fleece lay in this stream to guard the way. Sometimes, too, the dragon used to coil itself around the oak where the fleece hung. It was always somewhere in the valley and was sure to be wakeful and watching. Before Jason could reach the Garden of Mars, the day was spent, and the moon had risen and was flooding everything with her silvery light. Jason was glad to see that the night would not be a dark one. When he reached the stream between the two high rocks, he looked sharply for the dragon, but it was not there. Then with some difficulty he climbed along the narrow path at the side of the stream and went down into the valley. This garden of Mars was certainly not a beautiful garden. Everything in it seemed to have been struck by a blight. The earth produced no grass, but was covered instead by bare brown rocks, whose edges looked sharp and dangerous. The trees seemed to have lost their power of bearing leaves and bore only thorns, while their branches were twisted into the most fantastic shapes. Jason soon saw the golden fleece. It was glorious, the one bright spot in the whole garden. It hung on a low branch of the giant oak and seemed to throw off flakes of light. And there, coiled around the huge trunk of the oak, was the dragon. It was spotted and blotched and had a sharp-pointed, fierce-looking crest. It looked very ugly and dangerous. As Jason came nearer to the oak, the dragon raised its crest and began to roar and bellow so loud that the sound could be heard in Colchis. But safe at his hand, Jason had the little violet flower which Medea had plucked on the banks of the leaf. He held this flower out before him at arm's length, and the moment the dragon smelt its strange odor, it lowered the crest on its drooping head, closed its fierce eyes, and fell into a deep sleep. Then Jason took down the beautiful golden fleece from the oak and went to tell his Argonauts that he had conquered the dragon, as well as the fire-breathing bulls, and had obtained possession of the coveted fleece. They all agreed that they had better take the Argo and sail for home while it was still night. When the heroes were getting the Argo underway, Medea stole away from the palace and joined them. By the time the sun rose the next morning, they were well out to sea. Word was brought to King Aetes that the Argonauts had taken the Golden Fleece and gone, and that Medea had gone with them. The king went down to the shore with a great company of armed men and sent some of his war galleys after the Argo. But the Argo, leaving the Colchian ships far behind, soon passed swiftly out of sight, and the angry king was left standing on the Colchian shore. The heroes reached Iolcus in safety. And there Jason reigned long and happily in the place of King Peleus, the usurper. <laughs>